Have you got more questions? Just a few. Oh, there. That is here. So you had a few questions, I stopped. No, I No, no. Uh, how many have the witness? Uh, you can bring the jury. Thank you. Be seated, please. Officer Decker, I handed you back um, the transcript of the statement we just listened to because I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, there was a part on page 19, if you would just turn to that, that I wanted to ask a question about. Towards the top, there was a reference on the, on the sheet somebody addressed a mark and do you mind talking with Tom a little bit and it appeared there was another voice was that the defendant's father Martin do you recall what that was about I don't um, but Tom would be the detective that was the first name of the detective that was there from Snohomish County so knowing that the father was also present that would make sense to me now as I sit in and was the defendant's father's name also Martin yes David Peets? okay yes and then the other thing I just wanted to ask you generically is there's a point um, where you talk about side B or a tape. Was this originally um, recorded on a cassette tape? Yes. Is that how you had what you used back in 2006? Yes, that's correct. And there were a few portions where it appeared you had to, it stopped suddenly. Was that when the tape just ended and you had to flip it over? Yes, and if you're not watching it closely, um, you don't catch that it's about to end until it ends. So it caught us off guard a little bit. Just want to ask you about a couple of additional areas. One is, um, do you recall um, looking into um, whether a diamond tennis bracelet had been pawned? Yes. Um, do you recall, first of all, why you were doing that? Yes, it had come to our attention through the investigation that there was a diamond tennis bracelet that Nikki wore regularly, and that bracelet was unaccounted for. And so one of the jobs that we had as investigators was trying to determine what may have happened to that bracelet. And one way to do that is to check the pawn records to see if any like item had been pawned um, by a person or persons. And so did you indeed um, try to get information from pawn shops or something like that? I actually went to, uh, at that point in time, we had a woman in our office who um, did the analyst uh, portion of the pawn shop query for us. So I could go to her and tell her this is what I'm looking for, and then she would take the time to do the research and then get back to us with her findings. Were you ever able to find the tennis bracelet? No. Did you at one point um, early in the investigation go to the 24-hour fitness gym in downtown Seattle? Yes. And um, was that the location where the defendant worked at the time? Yes. I want to ask you some specific questions about that. Let me know if you need to refer to your report. Do you recall approximately what date you went there right now? No. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to um, March 7th of 06 at 0900 and see if you can confirm whether that's the day. Could you give me the page on the upper right, please? It's, on mine, it's 42. Good. Is that the upper right page? Yes, I believe that's the correct one for Thank our you. copy. Exhibit 34. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry. And yes, March 7th of 2006 at 9 o'clock in the morning was when we made contact at the 24-hour fitness. And did you look into information about an emergency door at that location? 
Yes. Um, what were you attempting to learn about the emergency door? Whether or not the emergency door alarm system was functioning. And is that a door that would go out from the club to the street? Yes, it was located on the north side of the building adjacent to the uh, boiler room. And is it a door that typically if someone went out it, um, an alarm is supposed to go off? Yes, that's correct. And did you learn whether or not that was working? Your Honor, objection insofar as I believe this answer is going to implicate the hearsay rule based on what somebody else told her. Uh, it may well. Uh, you need to lay a foundation. Let me ask an additional for question. For personal knowledge, if, if she's going to testify about the operation of the door, then she can, I suppose if she went out the door that day, she could tell us something about what happened when she went out. But I, I'm surmising that you're wondering what was operational Previously. I, I will ask a different question, Your Honor, to not implicate hearsay. Um, did you go through the door or test the door to see if there was an alarm, Officer Decker? No, I did not. Did you talk to an employee about it? Yes, I did. Did you also instruct somebody to make a telephone call from a boiler room at the club? Yes. What was the purpose of doing that? We wanted to determine whether or not you could, in fact, make a phone call from inside that boiler room, whether there was coverage, cell coverage. And it was at the main boiler room at the club, to your recollection? Yes. And was uh, there cell coverage on the call that you observed then? Yes. One thing I forgot to ask you when we were discussing the tracking is on some of the photographs, there were orange flags placed in different places. Were those your flags? Yes. What was the purpose of the flags that you would place? I often will use a visual marker, either the flag like you saw, or perhaps some flagging tape to indicate where it is I'm seeing the footprint impressions or the tracks. It just helps me have a visual overlay of what it is that I'm recognizing as footprint evidence. There were some flags um, right over near the body, sort of on the left side. Was that marking the toe dig that you referenced earlier? Yes, one of those flags was marking the toe dig. There were also some flags more out by the cement area of the cul-de-sac. Do you recall what you were marking out there? Likely additional footprint evidence. Just a moment, Secretary. Mm -hmm. I don't have any questions right now. Thank you. Are you asking questions? Yes. Uh, could you leave those transcripts up there? Just sure. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detective Decker, I'm David Allen, and we've uh, introduced each other to each other this afternoon, yes? Yes. And as you know, I represent, I'm one of the attorneys for David Peets. Yes. Yes. Um, Detective Decker, first, um, just so we get the dates right, February 6th was the date that you went out to the scene in Burien when Miss um, Peets's body was discovered, is that right? Yes. And February 6th was also the date when you and three other detectives <coughs> went to the Peets condo up in, is it Linwood? Yes. Is that where it is? And interviewed Mr. Peets, right? Yes. And uh, the time you were out at the scene, uh, that's the scene in Burien, that was approximately 2 p.m., wasn't it? Yes. And you were up in Linwood interviewing Mr. Peets at approximately uh, 8 p.m. or maybe a little bit before. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So would it be fair to say that on February 6th, uh, once you got word that a body was found, you were working pretty much continuously on the case through at least uh, sometime in the later evening? Fair yes, statement? that's correct. Okay. Um, now, when you arrived at the Pete's residence, uh, were you driving by yourself or would you, were you driving in an automobile with some other detectives? I don't recall. I think I was by myself, but I couldn't say for sure. Okay. And um, before you got to the Pete's residence, um, you went to uh, some sheriff's substation in Snohomish County, did you not? Yes, that's correct. And that was to meet with um, a detective Ditto, correct? Yes. Uh, a detective Stitch or Stick? Uh, Sergeant Stitch, yes. Sarge, Sergeant Stitch. And they're both uh, detectives with Snohomish County, yes? Yes. And they're in uh, basically parallel positions that you and Detective Anderson are in, in uh, King County, basically major crimes, right? Yes, that's correct. And so before you went out to the, um, uh, to the Peach residence, uh, you basically probably had some discussion on how the interview was going to take place, right? Yes. Okay, and that's standard operating procedure for detectives? Uh, typically, yes. And was it decided that Detective Anderson would take the lead in asking questions? Yes. And I, I hear, or I've heard um, Detective Ditto mention some on the tape, so he, he was involved at least with a few questions, I take it? Yes, I think his name is mentioned at least once, yes. And you're in a few places on the tape also? Yes, yes? that's correct. Okay. 
Now, at the time you went out to the Peets residence and showed up, Mr. Peets was expecting you. Is that right? And if you want, you can take a look at page. Yes, please. And I'll look at the upper right-hand page because I think ours have different Bates numbers. But take a look at page 21. Actually, if you could give me a date time stamp. And I'm sorry. My page numbers are different than yours. I did that wrong. Well, do you see the page on the upper right-hand corner? Is there a page on your page number on yours? Counsel, her copy is slightly different. But well, this I just want to find out. Do you have a page number in the upper right-hand corner? I do have a page number. Yes. Okay. Go to page 13 and tell me if that appears to be. What would be February 6th, then at, say, 2005 hours? That is actually on my page 14. Okay, so we're a page off there. But please go to 2005 hours on February 6th. Yes. Does that refresh your recollection that Detective Ditto had called David and David said he was heading home and would meet with you at his home? Yes, it does. So the meeting was set up ahead of time? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then when you first saw David at his residence, I believe you described him as very anxious and upset. I'm going to refer to my report so I can be accurate. And that's fine. And please look under 2034. Yes, I have Dave appeared very anxious and upset. And David wanted to know, wanted you to tell him or the detectives to tell him if the woman's body or if the deceased woman found in Burien was Nicole. Do you see that? That would be about the fourth paragraph from the bottom. Starts out, Dave appeared very anxious and upset. Yes, I do see that. Yes. There was some media coverage of the fact that a body was found in Burien. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And obviously David wanted to know if that was his wife. Yes? Yes, that's correct. And he was told by Detective Anderson that it probably was, at least based on preliminary information. Yes, that's correct. And then sometime soon after that, the interview with David Peet started, correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, about 20 minutes of that was off the, not off the record, nothing's off the record really, but not tape recorded, right? The time from 2034 hours to 2043 hours, correct. Okay. And then at 2043 hours, that's approximately the time when the tape recorded interview started. Yes. When you went out to the Peet's residence, David Peet was there, correct? Yes, that's correct. And also his father, Martin Sr. Yes, that's correct. He was there also. And Martin Sr. sat in for part of the interview, yes? Yes. And as the prosecutor pointed out when she asked you a few questions a few minutes ago, Martin Peet was asked to leave during part of the interview. Yes, that's correct. And only the two of them were there, nobody else, right? Aside from Detective Ditto and Sergeant Stitch, that's correct. Correct. And just so the jury knows, there's a sound in the, on the tape, especially in the beginning of it, that sounds like a cat meowing. Was there a cat around there, do you recall? I recognize that as well as a cat meowing. I don't now, as I sit here, remember a cat, but that certainly sounds like a cat, so I would have to say yes. Okay. Okay. And basically the interview was uninterrupted, I mean, except for turning over the tape and David asking to use the restroom once. Yes, that's correct. I'd like to ask you a few questions about your tracking, and it sounds like you're one of the most experienced trackers around, perhaps with the exception of Mr. Joel Hart. Is that a fair statement? I don't know if I'm one of the most experienced, but I'm up there in experience, yes. You have thousands of hours training. Yes, that's correct. And you probably have thousands of hours tracking also. Yes, that's correct. And not only do you do tracking with regard to law enforcement investigations, you also have done tracking involving search and rescue. Yes, I'm part of an international search and rescue team, so I've deployed out of the country to do tracking for search and rescue. I'm not allowed to do it here locally because it's too close to what I do for a paid job. It's a conflict with the labor laws. Okay. And I'm not questioning your qualifications or your skill, but your training was all from Mr. Joel Harden, is that right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And would it be fair to say that Mr. Joel Harden is quite a controversial individual? Your Honor, it goes to training. 
Correct. We may need to address this further out. I thought we'd address this in pretrial hearings. So right. let me, can I have the jury go back to you? Your Honor, I'm ask the prosecutor. I, I want to try to get this witness off the stand when she's in a hurry. Maybe I can find out from the prosecutor what the problem okay. is. Right. Talk to her. I, I have, anything you say to me has to be with me. Please go back to the jury. Have a seat. What's the objection? Your Honor, I'm a little unclear, but my understanding is that Mr. Allen wants to bring up basically dirt that he believes an article says about Mr. Hartman, a bar article that he had attached to his original trial brief. Let me suggest that bringing up dirt, I don't know what you, we address this in pretrial. And what I said in pretrial is that the tracking science, if you want to call it a science, has been accepted by our Court of Appeals. And therefore, we do not need a fry hearing. Correct. That does not mean that he is unable, that is Mr. Allen is unable to cross-examine this witness about the science of tracking. That's not what he's doing. Well, I don't know what he's doing. He said a controversial figure. And what he's suggesting is that in the scientific community, this man's theories have been attacked. And is she aware of those attacks? And that's fair game for cross-examination. If he wants to attack this person, this person who's not present personally, that's a different issue. And I don't know what is attacked. Perhaps we need to know, because I believe what he's going to do is try to bring up examples that were cited, that this is junk science, et cetera. And this is not attacks in the scientific community of which Mr. Hardiner trackers are a part of. This was an article in a bar magazine that said some people don't understand tracking or believe it. First of all, this is not the person who's on the stand. Second of all, this is not the person. So I think it's an indirect way to try to attack it when she's not Mr. Hardiner. So why don't we find out exactly what Mr. Allen wants to ask, and then I can see if I can see the other objection. If he is cross-examining it to undermine the science of tracking, he may do so, even though I said it's admissible. That is not the point of that. If he wants to attack someone personally, he may not do so, since the person's not even present. But I anticipate that he... I would like to ask what he wants to ask, because I believe it's the latter. Your Honor, this is not anything that something's going to come in and can't be erased if somebody objects. I think this is fair cross-examination having to go with a person's training and the science behind the tracking. And she said that she got all her tracking from Mr. Hardiner. And I think I'm agreeing with you. Thank you, Your Honor. As long as you... I don't know whether you intend to somehow attack Mr. Hardiner personally or simply attack the science. Well, I may attack some of the training she received from Mr. Hardiner. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, well, that's where I plan to go, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. First of all, we can excuse Officer Decker if he wants to not say in front of her what he's going to ask. I'd like to know what he's going to ask. Second, if he's going to use stuff from an article that she hasn't looked at or have in front of her, then she should have a chance to review that. Your Honor. And at this point, I believe that he wants to ask because he wants to... May we find out what he wants to ask so we can make sure? I'm entitled to make a personal attack on the person that trained her. Actually, not a personal attack. That's right. A professional attack. A professional attack. A professional attack. You don't... And you may. Thank you, Your Honor. But it's attacking the science and the way he goes about the science, not attacking him personally. That's right. And you may do that. Thank you. All right. Bring the jury back in.
You may be seated. Detective Decker, back on the record. Um, Mr. Joel Harden runs his training program. It's basically a private business. Is that right? That's correct. And that's located in Montana? No, that's not correct. Whereabouts is it located? Well, he actually lives in Idaho, but the trainings are given throughout the country. Okay. So he goes around the country and he gives trainings to law enforcement, I take it? Yes. Also probably search and rescue? Yes. People uh, that you're aware of, other companies that also... Yes. Okay. And they're private companies also? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harden, at one point you said was a tracker with the Border Patrol, yes? Yes, that's correct. He's retired now? Yes. yes? And in terms of your um, uh, ranking that you have, for want of a better word, uh, you're what's known, or at least you have the ranking in Mr. Harden's organization as a sign cutter, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And there's three levels of trackers, or did I miss that? Is there one further than, is there one higher than sign cutter? No, sign cutter is the highest. The lowest one is novice? Yes. And then apprentice, journeyman, and sign cutter. Okay. And um, these other tracking companies, uh, do you know if they give out their rankings also, uh, something similar to Mr. Harden? Some of them do, yes, that's correct. Is sign cutter uh, only limited to Mr. Harden as far as you know? Um, I believe Universal Tracking Services uses that same terminology. Okay. Uh, as far as you know, there's no organization like umbrella organization like we might have in the medical field like the American Medical Association that is an umbrella organization over tracking uh, companies. That's correct. Okay. And also, um, you've probably heard of uh, doctors being board certified. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. That there are organizations like the American uh, Board of Pediatrics that awards board certification, yes? Yes. There's nothing like that in the tracking field, is there? Well, we have what we call board certification, but it certainly doesn't rival anything like you would see in the medical profession. And that's through Mr. Harden, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, these other organizations may have their own board certification, right? Yes, that's correct. So the weakness here that I'm wondering is, uh, let's just assume, and let's not even talk about Mr. Harden. Somebody's running their own company, and they're the ones that give out the ratings, like you're a novice apprentice or, or sign cutter, and they're the ones that give the board certification. If they're making, if the person that's doing these courses uh, has a fundamental flaw in their uh, understanding of the science of tracking, uh, they could be spreading that throughout all the people that they train without anybody independently uh, being able to uh, certify otherwise. Well, the final decision, although it rests with Joel, is based upon input from several senior trackers. So you have multiple input coming in to um, acknowledge whether somebody has met basic criteria to be certified. Um, and these other trackers work for Mr. Harden also? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Now, in terms of um, your work on this case, um, uh, you were basically wearing two hats, weren't you? Uh, one hat was um, your one in the case, correct? Yes. I, I mean, not the lead, but one yes. of the leads. I was called the secondary, which means the lead. Okay. And the other hat that you're wearing is you're an expert witness. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, when you went out to the scene, um, do you know if you drove out by your, you said you received a phone call from the sergeant uh, dispatching you to the scene, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, do you know if you drove out by yourself or with somebody else? I would have driven there by myself. Okay. And um, you had heard about Nicole Peetz's disappearance prior to being sent out, I take it? Yes, that's correct. Uh, do they use BOLOs in King County Sheriff's Office? Yes, they do. BOLOs, an acronym for be on the lookout for? Yes, a missing person bulletin is how this initially came to our attention. Okay. Yes. And so that's something that you as one of the major crime detectives would certainly take. And uh, there was certainly a King County connection in this case because even though Ms. Um, Peets lived up in Snohomish County, uh, she had, a, at least there was some suggestion she might have come down to King County for an AA meeting. Yes, yes that's correct. And so you, uh, as with other detectives and other police officers, um, have these um, notices that are received that you certainly take, um, take care to sort of follow up on if anything happens, right? I'm not I sure didn't. I understand what you mean by notices. Well, anyway, strike that. 
So from the BOLO, or at least the – I'm using the wrong term. Tell me again what it's called, a missing person? Missing person bulletin. From the missing persons bulletin, you would have known that Ms. Peetz went missing on – it would have been Saturday, the 28th of January. Yes, that's correct. And when you went out to the scene for – to see – the only information you had, I suppose, from the sergeant was that a body was located in South King County. Yes, that's correct. Once you got out there, were there other detectives there who had arrived before you? I believe so. I believe Sergeant Gates was on scene at that time, and I don't recall if Sergeant Anderson was already there or if he showed up right around the same time I did. Okay. Had any of the brambles or bushes been moved away from the body? No. Okay. It would have been obvious to somebody, especially a trained police officer, that that was a young woman's body there, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And at that point, did you suspect that that might be the missing person that was in the missing person's bulletin, Ms. Peetz? Yes. Okay. So you indicated that you made observations at the scene that had to do with your tracking knowledge and training, right? Yes. And you've described many of them having to do with looking at foliage, looking at the branches or brambles that were bent or broken and leaf material and degradation. You said it was very important for you to check the weather, right? Yes. And that's the weather in the preceding days, right? Yes. But you certainly knew on the day in question that you were out there, February 6th, that it was a sunny day, right? Yes. And that would have been dry, and that has something to do with material and how material functions when it's outside, right? Yes. But it was important to go back the earlier week or several days before so you could then key that into your knowledge of tracking in order to come up with an estimate, right? Yes. Before I get there, you've offered the opinion that the body was placed in the position it was in. Did you use the word gently? Yes. And I guess my problem with that term is I have definitions, and I want to see which one would fit here. One is if something is done gently, it's done with kindness. Another definition is it's done without force. So I take it your opinion has to do with the second one, that the body was placed there without force. That's correct. And is it fair to say that based on the location of the body, and especially based on your training as a detective and a tracker, that it appeared that the body was placed in a way that it was hidden, at least the person may have been trying to hide it? Partially concealed, not completely concealed. But at least the person, it might appear to you, or one could infer that the person was trying to conceal it. Possibly. Okay. Well, let me go through a hypothetical here. Based on, well, first, that area had a lot of brambles, right? Yes. Blueberry, blackberry? Blackberry. Okay. And they were dense, right? Yes. If a person was going to take a body there and place it there with force, like throw it down, they would end up on top of the brambles, wouldn't they? With the weight of that body and the brambles that were there, I would expect that the body would not necessarily be on top, but would have sunk down to a certain level just due to her body weight. Okay. But the body would have taken the brambles down with it, at least the brambles that were underneath it. Yes. So the body would be fairly visible under those circumstances. It could be, yes. Okay. On the other hand, if somebody wanted to conceal the body, one way to do that would be to lift up the brambles or make a little opening and drag a body in and place it in there and try to pull back the brambles, right? Yes. And that would fit in with not using force, right? Yes. Now, in terms of timing, I believe your opinion on that was, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the body was at the scene a week plus or minus a couple days, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So if we look at a calendar here, and I'm pulling out Exhibit 2 here, and I'm starting with January, and let me go back to February, actually. This is Exhibit 13. 
So if you were out there on the 6th of February, and it had been there for a week, we'd go back to the prior Monday, which would have been January 30th. Yes. And if we go two days earlier from that, we'd be at February 1st. Is that right? Yes. And if we went two days before then, it would be the 28th of January. Yes. So in terms of coming up with that opinion, you already told us that it was necessary for you to look up the weather on the computer program. Yes? Yes. And now we're talking about 2006, and I don't believe there were any smartphones back then, as far as you knew. You didn't have one then. No, I did not. So you weren't able to access the Internet and pull up a weather program when you were out at the scene, right? Correct. We didn't even have laptops assigned to us at that point. That's correct. So you had to go back and do that at the station. Yes. Now, the entry in your follow-up report for that day says Monday, February 6th, 06, at 14.06. And I believe that would be your page 11, since you're one page after me. Yes. Okay. That talks about Monday, February 6th, 06, at 14.16 hours. The 2.16, that's the time you were out at the scene, right? Yes, that's correct. And then you have the weather for the week there. You see that? Yes, I do. This would have had to have been inserted, typed into your report sometime after February 6th, right? Oh, yes, that's correct. Right. So the date here doesn't mean it was entered that day. Correct. And that could have been several days later? Typically, I'm pretty anal about keeping up on my typing in my notes, so it wouldn't have been any longer, I don't think, than several days later. Okay. And what you determined after going online and looking at a weather program is that on the 5th and 6th, there was no precipitation, right? That is correct. But in the many days before that, there was anywhere from moderate to heavy precipitation, right? Yes, that's correct. Certainly on the 29th of January, it says 1.24 inches of rain. Yes. And that's a lot of rain, isn't it? Yes, it is. And even on February 4th, there was 0.41 inches of rain, which is also a lot of rain, at least for the northwest. Yes. That's heavy rain, right? Yes. Okay. So one thing that I believe you said on direct, and I tried to get it as best I could, is that prior to coming up with an opinion based on your observations at the scene in terms of timing, you want to know when the victim was last known to be alive, and you wanted to make sure so that your findings were consistent with this. Is that a fair statement? No. Actually, what I want to do is have as much factual information as I can as a baseline, and then my objective is to determine whether or not the physical evidence that I see at the scene is consistent or inconsistent with what we believe to be true. Have you ever heard of a term called confirmatory bias? I have not. Okay. Have you ever heard of a concept where sometimes people subconsciously, even if they're in a highly trained situation such as yourself, can have their judgment or their opinions subconsciously affected by other information that they've been presented that they don't even realize they're using when they come out with their opinion? Okay. Would you agree that that's a possibility that that could happen to anybody? Yes. And would you also agree that sometimes people get information post-event, and if we're talking here, I'm talking about the event being February 6th, finding the body. Sometimes they get information post-event, and they sort of mush that in with information they had before, and it's hard for them to tell when they got the information. Have you ever seen that in terms of your investigations? I'm aware of that. That can happen, yes. Okay. Wouldn't you agree that if you were to come up with an opinion without having these other facts in terms of when the person went missing, that you came up with an opinion without knowing any of that, that it would be perhaps a more accurate opinion, at least an opinion based on facts that you discerned at the scene, as opposed to other information that might have come in? Actually, I'm going to disagree with that. Okay. Well, that's fair. Now, 
In terms of um, the body at the scene, um, it would have been clear for, to you as a detective, forgetting about any of your training as a tracker, uh, but just as training as a detective, that um, the body hadn't been there for just a day or two. That's correct. And that had to do with the condition of the body, right? Yes, that's correct. But it would also be clear to you, based on your knowledge, that the body hadn't been there a couple weeks. That is correct. And you've been trained in body analysis, or if that's the right word for it, or what happens to bodies when they're uh, left outside or different places, right? I mean, you have experience in yes, that area. Yes, I do. Okay. So, just so we understand it, um, uh, you're, you're familiar, I don't mean to say you're a DNA expert, but you're familiar with DNA testimony, yes? Somewhat, and I'm certainly not an expert. And I don't mean to suggest, but uh, you've heard with DNA experts, uh, they talk about sometimes the possibility, the probability of this being someone's DNA is oftentimes up in the hundred thousands or the millions or even the billions, right? Yes. And tracking evidence, at least how long something has been at the scene, that doesn't fit into the same category, does it? No, not at all. It's basically approximations, right? Yes. And you made approximations here, right? Yes, that's correct. And the approximation um, is, well, it could have been there for a week, it could have been there for five days, it could have been there for nine days. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, in terms of the um, mud and whatever that was found on the body, on the shoulder, you said that did not appear to be from the actual place where the body was found, right? Yes, that's correct. But you said that there was a construction site uh, maybe on the way there uh, within walking distance, right? Yes. And maybe the mud looked like something that came out of there. It's a possibility, yes. Yeah, it's a possibility. So uh, maybe the body was fell or something, was picked up. It's a possibility? Yeah, I don't know. Yes. Or I suppose another possibility was that the person was killed in another area and um, during the act of homicide, uh, picked up dirt on her shoulder and then was left at the scene, right? Yes. By the scene, I mean where she was found. Yes, that's correct. I'm going to ask you a question about another part of your investigation. Um, now, you said you were the second lead in this case, and um, at least from as far as I can tell from your um, follow-up, uh, that seems to go through, uh, at least the first part of it in 2006, seems to go through, at least the last page I have is August 31, 2006. And I'm looking at your page, um, I think it would be year 71 now. Yes, I actually had some additional work that was done on this case that um, was in 2012. But if you take the 2012 out, then that is correct. Okay, and then you got called back in in 2012. Yes, yes? that's correct. And that was the time when uh, some or an arrest was made in this case, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So going back to 2006, um, there's um, what I would describe as uh, many entries in your report. I mean, it looks like you were working on it daily. Yes. Okay. Um, one of the people you interviewed uh, during um, your interview, I'm sorry, your investigation, was uh, a person by the name of Barbara Aronius. And now would you look at your page 22? And this would be 21, 17 hours. Do you see that? 21, 17 or 22, 17? I said it wrong, 22, 17. Yes, sorry. I have that. Okay. And um, you and Detective Anderson met with Barbara Aronius? Yes, that's correct. And I'm going to be asking you a statement she made, but before that I just want to sort of confirm that we have the right person. Um, she identified herself as Nicole Pizza's sponsee yes. in AA? Yes. Okay. Would you, um, you have a summary of the interview there, is that right? Yes, I do. And uh, just to make sure we're, we're all on the same page here, this interview was on... February 7th, 2006, at already said 2217 hours, right? Which is 1017 p.m. Yes, that's correct. And this would have been the next day after the body was found and the next day after you interviewed David Peets? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And um, you wrote a summary of the interview? Yes, I did. Okay. 
the interview wasn't tape recorded, was it? It may have been. Let me see if I sent that. I don't mention the fact that it was taped. Okay. Sometimes I do a summary, even if there is a taped interview. Um, my report doesn't indicate if it was taped or not. Do you try to be as accurate as possible in terms of your summaries? Yes. And you're trained, I suppose, uh, not only uh, police department uh, basic training, but detective training, and just all through your work as a detective to try to be as accurate as possible? Yes, you try to, yes. Okay. Um, would you please um, look down about, oh, about four paragraphs, five paragraphs, where it says um, um, she said it would be usual. Do you see that? It starts out, she said it would be usual. Okay. And, um, um, I'm not, no, I don't have it. Let me, can I approach the witness? Oh, okay. I just found it. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you have down here that while well, Ms. Uh, Aronia said it would be usual to meet with Nikki at about 9 or 9.30, allowing time to talk before the 10.30 meetings, Barbara said there was not a plan to meet before Saturday morning meeting on January 28th. Is that what's written down there? Yes. That there was not a plan to meet that morning? That's what's there, yes. That's correct. Thank you. No further questions. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State Exhibit 3. This has been previously identified as a 2007 interview with Barbara Arianis. Um, I'm going to have you turn to page um, 7 of that document and look at that for a moment. Your Honor, I don't think we have that document in front of us right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a marked document. Right, but I mean, I didn't bring that file to oh, with me. Okay, well, you can see it. Thank you. you. Show it to an show yeah, let me have her look at that page and then I'll hand it to counsel before I ask any questions. Yes. You're viewing that page? Yes. And do you see a portion on that page relating to what you were just asked about, um, relating yes. whether there was a meeting? Let me show that to counsel first. Detective, according to this uh, statement, a year later, does Ms. Ariana say she does believe Your Honor, can I board you on that before uh, with regard to foundations? I can tell the court what my objection is. Which that's not, that's an interview in 2007, not by her. She's reading somebody else's interview. That's hearsay. Um, that's not her interview. That's a different interview a year later. Can I see it? And they already have testimony regarding it. Sorry, Your Honor. Sustain the objection. This is it's marked, but it's not an admitted exhibit. Uh, since this witness didn't apparently do the interview, did she? She did not. It was Detective Crenshaw. All right. So if she didn't do the interview, it would be Detective Crenshaw, and then there'd be other issues as to uh, whether it's admissible. But for this witness, I'm going to sustain the objection. questions and, and referring to something he called confirmatory bias. Um, do you recall he was asking you about um, whether knowing information and going out and studying something perhaps 
that can affect what you're observing later and what you conclude. Do you recall that line of question? Yes. Um, have you had situations where you've responded to crime scenes as a tracker, been given information that a victim or witness has provided, and your tracking has actually found that that's not consistent with what they said? That's correct. Yes, I have. Um, so even though you were given information ahead of time, you have sometimes found that the evidence in the field doesn't match that. Absolutely, yes. In this particular case, um, you knew Nicole Peets had been last seen on the 28th of January, is that right? Yes. Is the fact that you know that the reason that you have now opined today that it was five to nine days that her body was likely out there? No. Um, Council also asked you about a hypothetical regarding um, another way that a body could be placed. I believe he said, couldn't somebody lift up the brambles and drag the body into this area? Do you recall that question? Yes. What would you expect to see around the scene if that had indeed been what happened here, if someone had lifted up brambles and dragged a body in that area? I, I expect to see what we call intertwining of vegetation, which is where um, generally from the force of a person walking through it or from manual manipulation, um, vines that have a certain symmetry are now um, over or under each other because they've been relocated or moved. Um, and secondly, when you're doing that, um, it can be painful because of the thorns that are on the vines. So sometimes that also leaves injury to the person, um, if that were to be the case. Did you see any of that here? No, I did not. Um, Council was also asking you about your description of the defendant when you went to his house that night him being in a fetal position. That that no, no, I did been. not ask that. Yes, he did. I didn't ask about him being in a fetal position. I didn't ask that question. Perhaps I misunderstood. Counsel was asking you about your observations of the defendant when he went to the house that night. That he started rather crying. Than, rather than relate what you think counsel asked, the jury can look at their notes as to what he asked. Just ask your question. That's fine. Do you recall the defendant crying and being in a fetal position when you responded to the house that night? As I sit here today, I don't have a memory of that. Um, all I can do is refer to what I have noted in my report, which it states he was in a fetal position. And what I want to clarify, and I didn't understand it from the cross-examination questions, but maybe I wasn't listening carefully enough. I want to understand if this reaction of his is a reaction that happened after you and Detective Anderson disclosed to him that indeed this was his wife's body that had been found. Can I refer to my May I refer to my report? Yes, if that would help okay. you. Prior to, as far as I can see from my report. So do you have any independent memory of whether he was already crying when you got there or if it happened after you told him that it was his wife's body? I don't have an independent memory, no. Okay. I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you. Just a clarification on the last one. Your report indicates that when you first showed up, Dave appeared very anxious and upset, right? Yes, that's correct. And then Dave asked um, you or the other detectives whether they thought it was Nicole, right? Yes, that's correct. And Detective Anderson said uh, preliminary information seems to indicate it is. Yes, that's correct. And at that point, Dave began to sob holding his father. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Nothing further. Your Honor, um, we have one witness who cannot come back tomorrow who's going to be very brief. It's an officer. Can I let this witness step down? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you can. I apologize. Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, you have uh, which officer? Officer Wilson, Your Honor, who works now for a different agency and cannot come back and had I'm to sorry, reschedule. Sorry, what? Micah Wilson. I just, you said he works for who, though? He now works for Puyallup Police Department and had to reschedule to be here today. And how long do you expect him to be in the stand? 10 to 15 minutes, probably. At least direct won't be more than that. And I can't imagine there'll be a lot of cross, but Call I don't know. <coughs> Where is he?
Come forward, sir. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm your testimony in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Be seated. Afternoon. Can you state your name and spell your first name and last name, please? My name is Micah Wilson. Micah is M I C A H. Wilson, W I L S O N. And who do you currently work for? I currently work for the Puyallup Police Department. Who did you work for in February of 2006? Uh, at that time, I was working for the University of Washington Police Department as a campus police officer. And do you recall in um, on February 22nd of 2006 what your shift was, what your hours were? I was working night shift. What did you do as a night shift officer for UW Police? Uh, at that time, I was a patrol officer, so it was just routine patrol um, of the UW campus and surrounding area. Did you have a car that you would drive in? Yes. Did you have occasion on the night of February 26th of 2006 to come upon a car that you later learned uh, was involved in a homicide investigation? Um, I, I don't recall if that was the exact date. It was uh, late February, um, okay. and, and yes, I did. Did you make a report? I did. Would it help you to know dates if I handed that to you? Yes, it would. Handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 38. Let me know if this is your report in this manner. Yes, it is. Let me know if it refreshes your memory as to the date that this happened. Yeah, February 22nd. And um, what time is it that you came upon this vehicle? Uh, it was in the early morning hours and. Uh, it looks like it was about 1.21 in the morning. Can you describe how it is that you came upon this car? Uh, the particular parking lot that uh, this car was in is not a, it, it wasn't a parking lot on the campus, but it was a private parking lot just um, outside the campus. And um, the way the, the interaction between the campus and the city is, um, the campus police officers end up doing a lot of patrol through areas that are not necessarily part of the UW campus, but are part of the city of Seattle, um, right next to the campus. And so I was just going from one part of the campus to the other uh, through this particular area where this parking lot was. And do you have the address or the cross streets that this parking lot was located at? Yeah, it was in the um, it was in the 900 block of Northeast 42nd Street. Um, What's the nearest, 42nd, obviously, is another cross street that's right near it? Is it 9th or? Uh, it would be 9th Avenue, Northeast and Northeast 42nd Street would be the nearest intersection. And um, where did you see this car? Where was it actually? Um, I was driving eastbound along Northeast 42nd Street uh, and the parking lot would have been on my left hand side. So it was mid block um, on my and left. How is it that you happen to notice or um, figure out that this car was involved in another investigation? Uh, the patrol car has a computer, and on these computers we can just conduct routine kind of random license plate checks uh, as we're on patrol, um, and that's looking for a variety of different things. In parked cars, it's uh, a lot of times used as a tool to help find uh, stolen vehicles that have been abandoned uh, and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, I had noticed that there were two cars parked in this parking lot, um, ran both license plates, and the computer then came back with a, um, a return that says that that vehicle was wanted in connection with the homicide investigation. Do you know or, or can you think of any particular reason why you chose to run the license plates in that particular parking lot on that particular night? Um, Having reviewed my report, um, I had noted that the, the previous night, that, that particular area is, uh, um, or at the time anyways, was a uh, area that was uh, kind of high in vehicle related crimes, uh, car break ins, um, vehicle.
What's really inside the big profile? Visit BigBlueTruck.org to schedule your donation pickup today or find a convenient drop-off location near you. Donations to Northwest Center support people of all abilities. And the reason that you decided to run the license plates on these particular cars uh, was because one of the reasons was that this area is known for uh, vehicle prowls and thefts. Is that right? I, yeah, I believe I said that was a factor. That and another one of the uh, things that this area is known for is stolen vehicle recoveries. Is that correct? Correct. And there were only two cars in this parking lot. Correct. And the one was this Jetta, which turned out to be associated with a homicide. Correct. And the other one had been prowled. Correct. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Anything else we'll see? No, no. We will recess for the day, Terry. Anything else today, Council? Your Honor, um, we're not endorsing them today. We just asked the prosecutor if uh, we could have some interviews and we were going to talk to them about it outside of court. Uh, we have all next week off. I assure you that they'll get plenty of notice. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow will be the, the end of the day, will be the end of the first week, right? Uh, the court would be appreciative if the parties could, you know, look at their, uh, both their cases and give me a better projection at this point of the length of trial now that we've uh, gotten through a portion of it. Everyone, I think, would appreciate that, including the jury. We'll be in recess. Thank you. And you are excused. <laughs>